Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Devaka Sharma, heading the Sales and Discovery Diagnostic Systems in India and South Asia for Perkin Elmer. At the outset of this event, uh, on behalf of Perkin Elmer, I welcome you all to this Perkin Elmer e conference in association with Society of Fetal Medicine on preeclampsia approach, challenges, and point of care. See, preeclampsia is one of the hypersensitive disorder of pregnancy. It is a major cause of maternal and prenatal uh, mortality and morbidity. In India, the incidence uh, of preeclampsia is reported approximately 8 to 10 percentage among the pregnant women. This e-conference uh, will provide all of us an insight into all the experiences in first trimester predictions, management of women with symptoms in second and third trimester with potential role of uh, point of care test. Now, hereby, I would like to introduce uh, the moderator of today's e-conference, Dr. K. Aparna Sharma, Dr. Aparna is an additional professor, Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine, Ames, New Delhi. Dr. Aparna is a renowned fetal medicine specialist in expertise in fetal intervention. She is a member, Executive Committee, SFM 2018-20, and board member, Fetal Medicine Com Subcommittee of AOGD 2015-17, and North Zone Coordinator, Practical Obstetrical Committee, FOXI 2015-17. She is a recipient of uh, uh, various awards, like you know, Foxy uh, Imaging Science Committee awarded in 2019, Foxy SUN IAC International Traveling Fellowship in 2019, Legend of Tomorrow Award NCY, Foxy in 19 in 2019. She's like so awarded for Foxy Junior Korean Award in 2018, and also awarded for uh, uh, Kamini Rao Oratory in 2017. She has uh, several publications in international peer reviewed journals. So I would like to now hand over to uh, Dr. Aparna. Over to you, Dr. Aparna. Thank you very much for joining us. Yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Devakar, for the introduction. And uh, very good evening to all of you. And uh, we are looking forward to a very interesting evening today on preeclampsia. To begin with, we would like I would like to welcome all the panelists, the guest faculty, the delegates who are here today to attend this session. We are having a very interesting lineup today of the topics. To begin with, we will be talking about the unmet need for preeclampsia. Then there is a session on the local experience with the first trimester prediction of preterm preeclampsia. And then local experience of the women presenting with symptoms of preeclampsia in OPD. And we also have a global speaker, international speaker with us, who would be speaking on global experience with new technologies for prediction of preeclampsia. And then we're going to have a very interesting panel discussion on embracing new approaches for preeclampsia prediction. Along with the topics which are very interesting, what is more stellar is the lineup of guest faculty that we have today with us, starting with none other than Dr. Ashok Kurana. And I don't think he needs any introduction. He's a legend in fetal medicine. He gives actually direction to the Society of Fetal Medicine from the very beginning, and he actually is taking it to newer heights. This entire program has been conceptualized by him, and he actually is you know, giving the uh, Society of Fetal Medicine the entire new roadmap. We also have with us today, Ms. Yvonne Parker, She's a vice president market development for the diagnostic business unit of, unit of work in Elmer. And she has been one of the lead figures who was uh, uh, pivotal in establishing the Down syndrome screening programs in the NHS. And she has been uh, working in the uh, collaborating with us and uh, for uh, establishing newer diagnostic business for the key areas for preeclampsia. So we welcome Mrs. Pa Ms. Parker. We have also with us none other than Dr. Suchitra Pandit. She has been the past president of Foxy. She has been the air chair of AICC RCOG. She has been the author of 115, more than 50, 115 publications and five books. And we all know ma'am as a great academician and an ardent clinician. Welcome ma'am to this panel. We have the president of Society of Fetal Medicine, Dr. TLM Praveen who's practicing fetal medicine for more than 30 years and he is passionate practitioner of fetal medicine and for performing fetal invasive procedures. Welcome, sir. 
and we have with us Dr. Vandana Bansal, who's an obstetrician with super specialization in fetal medicine. She's from Mumbai, and she has more than 25 years of experience in obstetrics and gynecology and fetal medicine. We also have with us Dr. Bijoy Balakrishnan, who's a specialist in fetal medicine from Kochi, and we all know him as a very ardent practitioner of fetal medicine. Welcome, Dr. Bijoy. We also have with us Dr. Chirayu Padiar, who's currently working as senior medical director in one of the largest stem cell bank of life in, uh, of India, and he's uh, working with the uh, life cell uh, diagnostics. So, uh, welcome, Dr. Chirayu. So with this, I would like to begin our session with the first uh, session for the day for which I would like to invite Dr. Suchitra Pandit and I would like to invite her to talk about the unmet need for uh, preeclampsia screening in India. So uh, may I please welcome Dr. Suchitra Pandit to talk about the same. Ma'am, please. Uh -huh. Thanks, Saparna, for the very kind introduction. And yes, I've stepped in in place of uh, uh, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, the president of Foxy. He's uh, held up with some meetings and he asked me if I could step in his place. So here we are. Uh, it's good that, uh, you know, the obstetricians, the fetal medicine, the biochemists, and everybody work together to look at this very, very important subject, preeclampsia in India, which is unmet need for diagnosis and early diagnosis obviously means you can think of an early treatment. Hypertensive disorders occur in about 10% of pregnant women globally. Preeclampsia is a serious multi-organ complication in pregnant women and it is defined by the new onset of hypertension and proteinuria at a gestational week of 20 or after. Incidence is 13 to 37% and we understand that as the order of pregnancy from singleton goes on to twins or triplets, the incidence goes much more higher. And along with preeclampsia, there are other diseases which are included in the HTP group. And that is the eclampsia, gestational hypertension, and chronic hypertension. Currently, the gold standard for preeclampsia diagnosis involves blood pressure measurement and determination of protein in urine. But because of the syndromic nature and varying clinical presentation of preeclampsia phenotypes, the specificity and reliability of these assessments to predict who will exactly develop HDP or HELP syndrome is very poor. So quickly to recap the definition, HDP is defined as systolic blood pressure of equal to or more than 140 millimeters systolic and 90 millimeters or more diastolic with the patient seated, rested, and not cross-legged by a calibrated sphygmo manometer with the right arm cuff at the heart level. We understand that because of the overdiagnosis and because we're really worried about preeclampsia, women with signs or symptoms of preeclampsia quite often get hospitalized for intensive monitoring till such time that preeclampsia is ruled out. But conversely, women who actually require hospitalization may be overlooked because preeclampsia was not predicted based on the current diagnostic criteria. So therefore, our job is to improve the sensitivity and accuracy of whatever methods we are doing for predicting preeclampsia because we want to prevent overdiagnosis and overtreatment of women with suspected preeclampsia. And at the same time, we should be able to allow more efficient allocation of healthcare resources according to the patient's risks. So as per the definition, if you're talking of just blood pressure and proteinuria, if you're going to just use these measures, many a times we may have missed out the unexpected sudden bouts of high blood pressure or preeclampsia in the later phases. And because of the unpredictability, because of the varying clinical presentation, as I've said before, we probably realize that there is a high unmet medical need for more reliable predictive markers, be it clinical, be it biochemical, or maybe a combination of the two to improve maternal and fetal and reduce the morbidity and the unnecessary hospital admissions. 
So the potential utility of angiogenesis related biomarkers, which include the SFIT1 and the PIGF ratio for predicting preeclampsia now are acknowledged in the latest guideline updates from German Society of OBGYN as well as the ACOG. And prognosis, the study which will be discussed a little later, will provide probably the most comprehensive evidence to date on the accuracy of the SFLIT and PIGF ratio as a short term predictive marker for preeclampsia. But we must remember that accurate prediction has a maximum potential to reduce the frequency of the adverse maternal and fetal outcomes associated with preeclampsia. Obviously, the aim of any clinician is to screen and do a surveillance for preeclampsia. And once it's detected, then there's an aggressive treatment, fetal surveillance and prevention of preeclampsia. But what we must remember that correct assessment of blood pressure is very, very important. And whenever the patient is coming first time, a minimum of two readings should be taken first if the readings are showing a higher side of systolic, at least three readings should be taken. And if the BP is 135 by 85, it should be alerted to the patient. The patient should be called back and the healthcare provider probably should be able to reach out to the patient much more frequently than a normal patient. And counseling the mother about the risks and the need to come for a follow-up is imperative. Now, just quickly before I go on to the newer predictors, I'd like to mention that current classification defines hypertension as either severe or non-severe. So mild to moderate is the one between 140, 159 systolic and 109 diastolic. But the severe grade is any systolic 160 or more and any diastolic 110 or more. And of course, it's accompanied with proteinuria, oliguria, cerebral or visual disturbances, pain in the epigastric region, pulmonary edema, impaired liver function, thrombocytopenia. But according to the newer classifications, the grade of proteinuria and the FGR, the fetal growth restriction, are not significant in determining severity. They may be a part of the clinical diagnosis, but they're not a part of the severity. And of course, we all understand the early onset preeclampsia always gives a much more better fetal outcome as compared to the uh, later, um, the early onset. If it's detected early, then yes, we can give some kind of a treatment. But otherwise, if there's a reduction in the fetal volume, the placental volume, or the abnormal Doppler indices, this will result in a lower birth weight. And the late onset, I'm sorry, I made that little mistake in the slip of the tongue. The late onset preeclampsia, which requires delivery after 34 weeks, probably this gives a much more better maternal and fetal outcome. Now, according to the newer guidelines by ACOG, as I've already mentioned, the detection of high levels of protein along with hypertension is not necessary. Just detection of proteinuria is important. And if there is any evidence of change in the kidney or the liver functions without signs of proteinuria, then again, it does not necessarily predict how severely the disease will progress. So as per the gestosis, the gestosis organization, gestosis of which currently I'm the president, uh, we have devised a gestosis score. This is a simple, easy to follow score. This is based on high risk factors. Concept of this was initiated by Dr. Gorak Mandrupkar and then later on developed by our core group of Dr. Gupte, Dr. Alpesh, Dr. Girija and myself. We are awaiting validation and we are very confident that the predictions will be much more better. I'll quickly run you through this score. We have given a score of one, two and three. One is the left-hand side of the women born as small for gestational age themselves, age either lesser than 20 or more than 40, obesity, any BMI between 26 to 30, nulligravids, family history of preeclampsia or a cardiovascular disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, an interpregnancy interval of more than five years and maternal hypothyroidism. All these merit a score of one. And if you're looking at the right hand side, gestational diabetes mellitus, obesity, but BMI more than 30 and multiple pregnancies merit a score of two. 
But if there is a pre-existing diabetes mellitus or a chronic hypertension or history of a hypertensive disease in the previous pregnancy, inherited or acquired thrombophilia, maternal chronic kidney diseases or women who has undergone assisted reproduction. Now, we're not talking of IUIs. We're talking of IVF, ICSIs and the, you know, the more super specialized ones. All these merit a score of three. Now, at the first antenatal visit itself, a careful history is taken. When I say careful, I mean not taken by an intern, taken by a senior clinician. This can warrant attention for effective prediction and prevention towards the mothers at risk. So points one to three may be allotted as per association of risk factor and development of preeclampsia. Now, if the sum total of the points is three or more than three, it should be marked at risk for a preeclampsia. But if the score is above three, the preventive measures in the form of low-dose aspirin, 75 to 150 milligrams, has to be started along with calcium, 1 to 1.5 grams, particularly in the low calcium intake group, as early as possible and continue it right till 48 hours prior to labor induction or delivery. The aspirin stops 48 hours before the delivery, but the calcium continues. So this was what we found was a very useful score. And of course, a little bit about the angiogenic biomarkers. Esflit, as we all know, is a soluble FMS tyrosinase kinase anti-angiogenic protein, which binds and antagonizes growth factors like the VEGF. VEGF is basically needed to maintain the healthy blood cells in the kidney, liver, and the brain. And these three are the organs which are most commonly affected by preeclampsia. Now, levels of Esflit increase prior to the onset of clinical disease and then appear to correlate with the disease severity. And if there is an imbalance, obviously this imbalance of circulating angiogenic and anti-angiogenic factors, which include raised Esflit and decreased PIGF, this has been found in women who are diagnosed with preeclampsia and before the clinical onset of the disease. So the prognosis is probably the study which is designated to investigate the use of this particular ratio in the short-term prediction of preeclampsia. So if you're looking at S-flit and endoglin, your increase in preeclampsia before the clinical manifestation of the disease and circulating levels of VEGF or the serum concentrations of PIGF are significantly lower. So you're looking at the ratio of S-flit to PIGF this particular ratio gives a superior performance with a diagnostic cutoff of 38.46. It has an excellent positive predictive value of 88.5 and a negative predictive value of 85%. Good sensitivity, good specificity. But then what is the problem? The problem is the ratio of the S-flit and PIGF ratio is elevated before the clinical onset of preeclampsia. But if there is a woman having a suspected preeclampsia, we still are not sure about the predictive value. Now, the ratio of less than 38 can be used to predict the short-term absence of preeclampsia where the syndrome is clinically suspected. And therefore, a ratio of 38 or lower probably has a value in predicting the absence of adverse maternal and fetal outcome within a week. And of course, we'll be discussing of the results of the prognosis just a little later, but adopting the S-flit and PIGF test in clinical practice probably has the potential to reduce the frequency of adverse pregnancy outcomes for the mother and fetus and decrease the healthcare costs associated with unnecessary hospitalizations. And of course, cellular and total fibrinolactin, I mean, basically these again have, uh, they don't have a very good sensitivity. They have a better specificity for looking at the total fibrinolactin are you looking at the cellular fibronectin? And we'll have to see, we'll have to wait for some more trials to be able to talk about the clinical advantage. But just a little bit part about the ASTRE trial before I finish off. We all are aware that this prospective multi-center study demonstrates the feasibility of incorporating the first trimester screening for preeclampsia into routine clinical practice. And we obstetricians are very happy that the fetal medicine people are now doing the screening for preeclampsia between 11 to 13 weeks by a combination of the maternal factors and biomarkers. And probably because of the detection rates, nearly 43% for preeclampsia more than 37 weeks at a false positive rate of 9.2.
and very, very importantly, this famous Esprit study. I mean, all of you are familiar with this, so I won't go into details about this. But we know that the results of the study population of 25,797 clearly showed that if women can be detected for preterm preeclampsia or term preeclampsia, in those situations, if they are a high risk, the ASPRI trial demonstrated that administration of 150 milligrams of aspirin as compared to placebo resulted in a 62% reduction in the incidence of preterm preeclampsia but had no significant effect on the incidence of term PE. And consequently, it was found that if this combined screening is done, probably it will have a better role. And it demonstrated that women with singleton pregnancy who were identified by means of the first trimester screening had a better chance of reduction of preterm preeclampsia. We just rely on the traditional approach of the uh, maternal characteristics and the medical history or just adhere to the NICE guidelines looking at 10 factors. In those situations, we probably may miss out on the atypical preeclampsias. ACOG does recommend use of aspirin, but then they're looking only at the factors where the patients had a previous history of preeclampsia. That way, we probably may miss out some of the women. And the approach of the ASPRAY trial, which combines the use of screening with the bias theorem to combine an a priori risk and the maternal and biophysical factors probably is much more superior than, than the clinical uh, method suggested by NICE and ACOG. And of course, the gestosis score, as I said, we've already given it to three to four groups of researchers in the medical colleges to find out the utility because that test is very, very simple to do. And of course, uh, the last point that I would like to mention is what is needed, the unmet need? Most of the women with a history of HDP, there was an analysis which was done in the US and it was found that most of these women was not, were not satisfied with the information that they received. They were not familiar with HDP. They probably needed more knowledge and most likely the poor provider patient communication relationship probably was not absolutely what it should be. And therefore, focused information on HDP and postpartum period is very, very important. Education of the caregivers is also strongly needed. And I think uh, these are the points which I wanted to put forward. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak on this. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for that uh, brilliant talk. And I think, ma'am, we are really fortunate that you could join us today being the chief of gestosis uh, committee and uh, that score on gestosis, that is actually another version of history-based screening and I think very, very relevant for our Indian scenario. Sir, would you like to say a few uh, comments? Would you like to give a few comments? Sir, unmute. Uh, thank you so much and thank you, Dr. Suchitra Pandit for introducing the topic to us so wonderfully. Um, what I wish to emphasize is that we are truly looking at an unmet need from various directions. We are looking at lack of availability of tests. We're looking at lack of availability of first trimester screening. We're looking at lack of ability of uh, availability of patient education, and we needed to work on this. I'm so glad that uh, we have an active chapter of the organization Gestosis in India now. Um, we know that this is an old organization. I was part of it 30 years ago. But I'm so glad that we put together a plan like this, which is appropriate to our uh, own uh, background, which is not the 2 to 4% preeclampsia incidence that we see uh, from the West, but an incidence that can be as high as 15% in several populations of the country from whatever data we have, as well as some areas which are actually telling us that they have a 27 to 33% um, incidence of incidence of hypertensive disease. And I'm so glad you set the ball rolling so nicely. Thank you. So uh, thank you, sir. With that, we we'll move on to our next segment in which uh, I would like to invite Dr. Chirayu to uh, talk about uh, local experience with the first trimester uh, prediction of uh, preterm preeclampsia. So uh, over to you, Dr. Chirayu, please. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, I am Dr. Chirayu Padiyar, 
I am working as a senior medical director at LifeCell, and today I will be talking on first trimester screening for the preterm preeclampsia. As we all know, preeclampsia affects around two percentage of pregnancies, and it can be classified as early onset preeclampsia with a delivery less than 34 weeks of gestation and late onset preeclampsia with delivery more than 34 weeks of gestation. The early onset preeclampsia is usually associated with a higher incidence of uh, adverse outcomes and the objectives of screening for preeclampsia at 11 to 13 weeks of gestation is basically to identify the cases that can benefit from prophylactic use of aspirin, thus reducing the risk of preterm preeclampsia by more than 60 percentage. The combined screening includes uh, three different aspects. The maternal factors, that is the maternal age and maternal high risk factors, the biophysical markers like MAP and UTPI, and biochemical markers PLGF and PAPA. At 10% false positive rate, the detection rate for preeclampsia at less than 34 weeks is around 96, 96%. For preeclampsia less than 37 weeks, it is around 77%. And for preeclampsia more than 37 weeks, it is only 53 percentage. We did a retrospective analysis on 1019 samples, and the samples were tested on fully automated autodelphia. Risk analysis was performed using life cycle software, which is IVD approved, and FMF algorithm was used for the risk calculation. So, analysis was done in two aspects. First, we calculated the a priori risk using the maternal age and maternal risk factors. And then we added biophysical measurements, MAP, UTPI, and biochemical measurements, PLGF and PAPA, to arrive at the final risk. All these uh, uh, markers, the MAP, UTPI, PLGF, and PAPA, were first converted to uh, multiple of median based on the gestational age of the patient and mapped onto this graph. As you can see here, all the different factors are close to the median of one, with a 5% margin on either side. This demonstrates that the population was homogeneous. We then evaluated each uh, individual biomarker and we split up the entire biomarkers uh, based on the low risk and high risk pregnancies. Uh, and we evaluated for preeclampsia risk at 32 weeks, 34 weeks, and 37 weeks. As you can see here, the mean arterial pressure was around 85 millimeters of mercury in the low risk pregnancies, which was elevated to around 90 millimeters of mercury for all the three different uh, groups. Then we check the uh, uterine artery pulsatility index. And here you can see the uh, UTPI for all the low risk populations is around 1.4, 1.5, which for a high risk patient, uh, high risk pregnancy, was increased, increased substantially to around 2.3, 2.4. That is almost around 70 percentage uh, higher than the low risk pregnancies. We did not see such a big uh, rise in the uh, uh, high risk patients at uh, 37 weeks and it was only around 1.8. Then we checked for the PLGF. The PLGF in the low risk uh, population was around 55 picograms per ml which substantially reduced to around 20 picograms per ml in the high risk cases for 32 weeks as well as 34 weeks. We did not see such a big drop for PE at 37 weeks. It was only around 38 picograms per ml. Then we check for PAPA. The uh, PAPA is also one of the markers. The PAPA in the low risk pregnancies was somewhere around 3000 milli units per liter, which dropped to around 2000 milli units per liter in the low in the high risk pregnancies after uh, uh, evaluating the individual uh, markers we then calculated the risk populations and uh, we checked uh, first uh, we first we compared the a priori risk that is the age risk versus the combined risk and this is how we got the data so around 995 patients were reported as low risk either by age risk calculations or by the combined screening calculation, establishing around 97.6% concurrence. Three patients which were be reported as high risk by age were found to be low risk on combined and 21 patients which were uh, low risk by age 
were found to be high risk on the combined screening. Then we compared the uh, risk obtained by biophysical parameters that is MAP and UTPI versus the PLGF. And we found 992 patients were have, uh, showing low risk by either methods of analysis. 11 patients were showing as high risk by uh, both the methods of analysis. Establishing a 98.4% concurrence. However, six patients which were uh, reported, uh, which would be reported as high risk based on biophysical parameters would be termed as low risk on addition of PLGF and 10 patients which would be low risk on biophysical would come out as high risk on addition of PLGF. Then we compared the uh, risk obtained by PLGF and addition of PAPA and as you can see there is a strong correlation between the two risk calculation. Uh, with a straight line passing through the origin. So 994 patients were uh, shown as low risk by either methods of uh, analysis. 18 patients were shown as high risk on both the methods of analysis, establishing 99.3 percentage concurrence. Three patients were shown as low risk on PAPA and high risk by uh, PLGF. And four patients were shown as high risk on PAPA and low risk on PLGF. So a total of seven patients were discordant. But if you look at the graph, you find that there was only one patient who was actually discordant. Rest of the six patients were in this twilight zone and they could have been reported on either side. If I would have eliminated the six cases, then the concurrence between the two methods of analysis would be 99.99 percentage. So in summary, inclusion of MAP, UTPI and PLGF which is as per the FMF algorithm, significantly improves the screening of preeclampsia as compared to the age and maternal factors alone, which is as per the suggestion of NICE and ACOG. We also found that addition of PAPA is not adding any further value in the risk assessment. So there are two stage strategies which are suggested in the stage one, which is primarily aimed at early onset of preeclampsia. And stage two a screening should be done between 30 to 33 weeks. And this is mainly aimed at late onset preeclampsia. Here, the combination of maternal factors, MAP and UTPI, can identify 90% of cases who will develop preeclampsia and require pregnancies during the uh, required delivery in the subsequent four weeks. Addition of serum PLGF or SFLT can identify all the cases, 100% cases developing preeclampsia in the subsequent four weeks. And in the pregnancies uh, complicated by preeclampsia, the serum PLGF is uh, decreased, SFLT mom is increased, and typically SFLT PLGF ratio is seen as greater than 38 is to 1. We then also check the uh, significance of serum PLGF in fetal aneuploidies. Number of papers have demonstrated that PLGF is significantly reduced in uh, 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 cases which are at increased risk of aneuploidies. So we took our uh, the same our database of 1019 samples and we compared the T21 risk by combined risk uh, analysis that is uh, uh, PAPA, beta HCG and NT and compared against uh, combined plus PLGF. So we found 80 855 cases were would be reported as low risk by either way of analysis. 50 patients would be uh, reported as uh, intermediate risk and 20 patients would be reported as high risk by whichever method we used, establishing a 90.8 percentage concurrence. Seven patients who would be reported as high risk on combined screening would be ultimately reported as intermediate risk on addition of PLGF. And 26 cases would be who would be uh, a low risk on combined risk calculation would either be reported as intermediate risk or high risk uh, on addition of PLGF. The uh, highest discrepancy we found in the intermediate risk zone, where 55 patients were found to be ultimately low risk on addition of PLGF. This is almost 50% of the intermediate risk population. And this would be the patients who would potentially require further intervention like NIPT. 
so we uh, uh, we uh, we suggest that addition of PLGF to the combined screening can significantly reduce the intermediate risk cases or the patients who require NIPD testing. However, more studies are required to confirm our diagnosis uh, hypothesis. So with that, I am ending my session. Uh, if you have any queries, you can please ask me. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chirayu. I think uh, uh, we will be taking questions in the end. But uh, sir, would you like to say something? Yes. Um, uh, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for letting us know that we seem to be headed in the right direction. And we have uh, made good inroads into the way we should be going in the first trimester. Um, there is this one uh, comment I'd like to make right here before people get the wrong message. And that is that our good friend Kipros Nikolaidis from the Fetal Medicine Foundation has been talking about using just PLGF and not using uh, PAPE or beta HCG and then showing that we won't miss too many of them. Uh, there are two aspects that we must consider in this, of course. The first is that he belongs to a very poor country called the United Kingdom, uh, where uh, all the healthcare is paid for um, by the government and through the NHS. So they're constantly looking for cost cutting and we have to consider that something is better than nothing in that background. We must realize that we come from a different population where we have no abundance of less resources, uh, no, no shortage of resources uh, in the people who actually go through this testing. So what is happening is that since everyone is going through this testing is actually um, being out of pocket, they don't really mind doing the PAPE bit. And really the PAPE bit getting knocked off or the beta HCG getting knocked off was purely for economic reasons and not for scientific fact. So we shouldn't get confused on that um, as we go ahead. Um, our patients expect guarantees. We know there are no guarantees in science, but what we really have to do is to try and get them to the best possible, the 99%, the 99.6% and so on. And that's what we're chasing. And, and we can't afford to miss even one Down syndrome because you're only as good as your last result. Um, they don't understand science. They want guarantees on, on what life is all about. And so these are the two perspectives we have to keep. But thank you so much for that very neat, clean, unbiased data and for your beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. And uh, before I go on to my presentation, I would like, just like to add that there are uh, some questions in the chat box and I would say that, you know, we will be taking those questions at the end. So I would just say that hang on. And those are really interesting questions th that are uh, coming up. So, um, so as we go on, I would just uh, say that uh, I would be talking now about the, sorry. Uh, so I would now be talking about local experiences of women presenting with symptoms of P in OPD. So now when we talk about uh, women presenting with symptoms of P in OPD, so it was very interesting trying to make this talk. So I went back to my unit, discussed this case with, you know, this situation with all of my residents, you know, when have we overdiagnosed preeclampsia, when have we underdiagnosed preeclampsia, and we had an interesting discussion over it. So what exactly are challenges of the preeclampsia management? Are we underdiagnosing it? Are we overdiagnosing it? Uh, so either ways, you know, we are a, a resource constraint uh, settings we have. So we have sometimes, you know, uh, situations like government hospitals are sometimes overdiagnosing, keeping the patients admitted, referrals are not decided. So I would just like to take a few scenarios in the OPD which happen and then what we have actually done and should we have done that? Wow. So this lady, she's currently admitted with us and she's a 22 year old lady. She's a third gravida, para two, previous no living issue because she had previous two uterine, intrauterine deaths. Now she presented to the OPD with a blurring of vision and headache off and on, on 14th of September, right? So that was almost a week back and her blood pressure was 120.96. On repeat, repeating the blood pressure, it was 140.88 and her urine albumin was blood. Uh, one plus. So she was admitted, she was worked up, her urine protein was 335, which was borderline. So then she was admitted and her blood pressure was normal. She was not on any antihypertensives, but her pH parameters were normal. 
then fetal growth was adequate, but she still admitted. As her, there were previous IUDs around this time. Now there's patient anxiety, there's physician anxiety. So can a predictor for worsening help in this case? So this was a very big question that we had in mind. Will this patient worsen? Will she not worsen? Will I send her home? If I send her home, uh, what would happen if she worsens and she comes back? What had happened in her previous pregnancy? So, you know, these questions do trouble us. And with such a bad obstetric history of previous two IUDs, I'm not able to send her home. So I don't know whether she'll worsen or she'll not worsen. Then there was this other end of spectrum where this, this another lady, you know, happened last month. Right, she was another 22-year-old young patient, second gravida. Then, 31 weeks pregnancy, admitted with gestational hypertension and anemia. Right, at 31 weeks, admitted, she was worked up and then started on Lebetlol at 200 milligram uh, BD. Blood pressure was controlled and sent home after two days because this is what we are supposed to do in view of a mild gestational hypertension. Now, after two weeks, she came back with severe hypertension and signs and symptoms of impending eclampsia and she was delivered by a C-section at 33 weeks and five days because of uh, impending eclampsia. Now, could we have predicted the worsening? Can there be a, could the care have been altered if there were predictors of worsening? So can the referral processes be improved if the tools of prediction are better in the outpatient care or even in those patients admitted with mild preeclampsia? Can they be referred? Now this, we are a tertiary care center. A patient comes to us at any time. In all probabilities, she will be saved. We are a good, we are, we are, have a good setup. We have a good neonatology division and we, are, we have a tertiary care facility. So any way patient comes to us, she can be saved. But can we say the same thing about an, any other setup in a peripheral uh, place? So these are two very, very extremes of uh, situations that are seen in patients who are presenting to us in the OPD. Under diagnosis, over diagnosis, under treatment, over treatment. So here is the role of technology and prediction. But let us start at the beginning. What are the challenges in the OPD when you see an antenatal patient in the terms of preeclampsia? There are challenges in taking history, challenges in measuring blood pressure, challenges in measuring proteinuria, challenges in screening for preeclampsia, and challenging in decision for admission. Now, when you talk about uh, challenges in history taking, we all know that we run busy OPDs. We give on an average two to three minutes at the most five minutes to a patient. And this is the list of the history taking based on which the detection rate is 40%. Now, do we think that we are able to take this kind of a history for preeclampsia screening, we are short staffed. The screening for preeclampsia is a long, long list. The other components of history also need to be covered. Routine antenatal care components need to be covered. The quality of care may not be possible. And in an actually, we have done a thesis, we have done a research, which actually, in one of the things, we noticed that 40 case records were reviewed and in which it was seen that family history of PE, history of smoking, detailed obstetric history, history of PE in previous pregnancies were most missed components in history that were not taken. And also the height of the patient in a busy OPD may not be taken. So it is the harsh reality and a challenge in most of the busy OPDs that these components of screening may get missed. These are some of how we can and what we have done is some of the technology that can be adapted is we made smartphone applications. Both of them have been designed by us as which incorporate history taking that you just on a click of a button, these components are there. Without entering these, you cannot move forward. So some of the applications, smartphone application, digitalization of technology. So when you take the history, you have to enter them. Otherwise you can't move forward. So to help us, and to help the peripheral health workers to move on. So one of them was designed by us, one of them was been designed in association with IIT Rookie. Then the challenges in measuring blood pressure. We all know that mercury manometer is no longer available. What is the device that we should currently be using? The aneroid devices are being commonly used, but they may be accurate. Automated devices are preferable. 
but are we checking the devices that we are using if you go on to the actually uh, validated home bp monitors or the uh, facility bp monitors are available some of the devices that we are using have actually been not recommended so yesterday only i was checking the devices that are validated and not validated and lot of our devices that might be very commonly be used are not validated again the correct cuff size becomes very important how to take blood pressure is very important the lady has to be sitting with the back supported arm supported uh, legs uncrossed feet unsupported cuff at the level of the heart uh, the size of the cuff should be at least 80% of the arms uh, circumference so uh, and the cuff like we do in winters woman is coming and we are you know busy tying the cuff over her sweater you know it's not a very uncommon finding that we are doing so the cuff and also the cuff width should cover uh, at least 40% of the person's arm so all of these things they do take a toll like you know if it is unsupported the variation is 6 mm unsupported arm is 10 mm and if you actually wrap the cuff over the clothing the variation is up to 50 mm of mercury and incorrect cuff size can up to be you know 10 mm of mercury and sitting with cross legs is again a problem the cuff size should be adequate what are the challenges in measuring proteinuria we have to first understand that how are we measuring proteinuria and in all of our clinical practice how are we measuring protein proteinuria visual dipstick visual dipstick is a good enough method and if it is positive then and available we can go for a spot urine protein creatinine ratio or and if it is more than 30 mg it becomes abnormal a negative dipstick can be accepted and now as uh, dr suchitra also mentioned that it is not required for diagnosis however a massive proteinuria is associated with severe outcomes the question of which proteinuria test is more ideal was assessed in the dappa trial and it said that uh, it does not support that we have always felt conventionally you know even as a teacher of post graduates i i go around in the rounds and i say 24 hours who work in a you know have you done the 24 hour urine protein to recommend that to say that she is a pre eclampsia but evidence does not support a routine recommendation for a 24 hour urine sample for all hypertensive pregnant women so if you have a spot urine creatinine ratio that's also a good enough test a uh, spot albumin creatinine ratio is better for predicting severe preeclampsia and all tests can be potentially be useful to rule out severe preeclampsia so the challenges are that the tipstick is not a perfect test and small number of proteinuric cases may be missed by a negative test so and there is an ongoing debate on the importance of the absolute quantification whether it is actually important to quantify proteinuria and once you have diagnosed proteinuria do you actually need to do it again and again so that is also not very uh, known and also there is an entity called as gestational proteinuria where there is proteinuria so patient comes to the opd there is a one plus proteinuria but her blood pressure is normal what do you do do you send the patient home or do you get very anxious that okay she might develop a blood pressure so that kind of an entity is still not clear so that is another situation in which a predictor of of uh, you know preeclampsia becomes very important and this is not very uncommon when the sister comes to you and tells that her urine albumin is 1 plus or a 2 plus and her blood pressure is normal so again will she develop preeclampsia will she not develop preeclampsia so that's another confusing situation and a challenge in the opd to manage who should be screened for preeclampsia and how to screen so that is the challenge that we are discussing today but yes we all know that we have to think preeclampsia because that is the one of the most important killers of pregnant women so all women should be screened for preeclampsia biomarkers no biomarkers we have to think about preeclampsia throughout pregnancy and screen by a simple blood pressure urine albumin in the first trimester as we would be discussing again and again if possible we need to do a complete screening with bp urine albumin maternal history and biophysical and biomarkers screening in the second and third trimester again think about biomarker screening the challenges of screening do remain the feasibility and cost we are here to discuss that but then the road to 
uh, you know, solving those challenges is opening up the discussion, having an academic discussion. Unless we do that, things will not move ahead. So we all know that if we just use the maternal risk factors, the detection rate is 44%, while if we incorporate all of the other things also, the detection rate goes on to 74 to 78%. So can technology help? So as I discussed the previous, all of the scenarios, are we over-diagnosing or are we under-diagnosing? What do we do in gestational proteinuria? Can a point of care tool help to predict worsening or to avoid unnecessary admission and advise timely referrals? So there have been studies which talk about a bedside urine test to, to detect hypertensive disorders of pregnancy because it has been seen that in preeclampsia, there have been uh, aggregate of misfolded proteins which can be detected. So this is another thing which is coming up and it needs more testing. It is more of a simple non-invasive uh, test for detection of preeclampsia. So to conclude, all women presenting to the antenatal clinic should be screened for clinical risk marker of preeclampsia from early pregnancy. All the current screening methods have their own limitations. There is a need to adapt screening methodologies according to the resource availability and according to the latest evidence. In resource limited settings, at least a history-based screening with blood pressure screening should be done at every visit. More evidence needs to be generated on the utility of the Congo Red dye-based point of care tool for triaging patients with suspected preeclampsia. So I think uh, that is all I would like to talk about in terms of challenges in preeclampsia screening in the OPD. So thank you for now. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. That was excellent. And um, can we go ahead with our next speaker now? Now I would like to invite uh, Ms. Yvonne Parker to talk about the uh, latest technology and the global experience with technology in screening for preeclampsia. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the global burden of preeclampsia. I think um, everybody recognizes that this is a, a major issue globally. And um, we anticipate that around 76,000 women die each year from preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders. So every seven minutes, one woman loses her life due to these often preventable conditions. <clears throat> this is something where uh, myself and Perkin Alma have been focused on this now for almost 20 years. Um, and a lot of the effort has gone into the, the preeclampsia screening from 11 to 13 plus six weeks. And we've heard already uh, the data from ASPRI um, and the prediction performance of the uh, screening in the first trimester. There are now approximately 70 countries who um, are using placental growth factor in the first trimester for screening. There are no countries at the moment that are actually um, having a national program, although there are several countries who are on that pathway to a national program. But unfortunately, with the recent COVID situation, many of those activities have been put on hold. Um, but we hope to see those resume in the near future. So that's really the sort of first trimester area. Then if we sort of look to the uh, management of symptomatic women, um, really we've got three options here. And um, whilst we've heard about the SFLIT PLGF ratio um, as a lab-based serum-based test, it is also possible to use just PLGF alone for aid in management of women with symptoms. And then, as uh, Dr. Aparna Sharma just mentioned, there is also the potential um, for a point of care test, um, which is known as the Congo Red point of care. And that test is based on um, the affinity of these amyloid proteins for the Congo Red dye. This is a, a you want, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think yes. your, your, your slides are not showing up yet. Um, are you using a PowerPoint or is it uh, without slides? Uh, I no, I have it on slideshow. My apologies. And if you could just briefly just start at the beginning again. I'm sorry about this. Can you see the slides now? Uh, not yet. Uh, we need to maybe switch, uh, switch off your share screen and then switch it on again. Are we on a share screen as yet? 
Um, we need your PPT to be open, of course, and uh, then onto share screen. The share screen button at the bottom of the page in the middle. Okay, let's try it yes, again. Wonderful. Um, we are now connecting. Yes. And yeah, wonderful. That's really nice. And finally, yes, and full screen. And thank okay. you. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. My apologies. I should have interrupted earlier. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, I mean, I think maybe people have heard what I said regarding the global burden of preeclampsia. So if I move to the next um, slide, in terms of um, the screening available, the first trimester, which we've heard about already, and um, we've heard about the fantastic ASPRI data, and now as a follow-on from that, FIGO have, in, have introduced global guidelines on first trimester screening, which offer a several options, whether it's the full option of the uterine um, artery pulsatility index, the mean arterial pressure and uh, PLGF, or at the simplest level, just to do, as Dr. Aparna Sharma mentioned, to do the um, maternal history plus the blood pressure. As I mentioned, we have approximately 70 countries um, utilizing PLGF from Perkin Elmer um, for the prediction and prevention of um, preeclampsia. None of these countries yet do we see national screening or national guidelines yet, although several countries are moving in that direction. In terms of, of preeclampsia management with symptoms, really we see three options available here. Um, yes, there is S-flit PLGF ratio as one of the options, but equally you can measure PLGF alone. And I'll talk a little bit about the performance differences between that and the S-flit PLGF ratio. And then there is a, an option for a point of care test, um, which again, Dr. Parnasharma mentioned, which um, is based on the affinity of a Congo red dye for these amyloid proteins seen in uh, women with, women's urine with preeclampsia. So if I just consider the, um, the Congo red test, I think obviously one of the clear advantages of this is that it does not require any instrumentation. So whereas you look at um, solutions for aid in diagnosis with uh, PLGF or S-flit PLGF, both of those will require some form of instrumentation. And as a result, will require a minimum number of samples to be utilized to offset the cost of that instrumentation. With the Congo Red test, the minimum number of tests is 10. Um, it takes about three to five minutes to do the test. You just need um, a small amount of urine from the, from the woman, and it is very simple to use. It is, however, qualitative. Um, so it's a, a visual interpretation where you're, you're looking to see um, whether there has been um, binding of the dye. Um, and so it is a yes, no answer. And again, as, as Dr. Parnasharma mentioned, we really need to see um, more data on this particular uh, approach. Um, we have some studies ongoing, and particularly studies where physicians are interested in seeing whether this particular test could actually help identify those patients who are going to have a sudden adverse um, change in their condition. Um, and so could it help with identifying the severity of the disease? If we now move to um, uh, the uh, comparison of PLGF versus um, S-flit PLGF and uh, another PLGF test, this study was undertaken by um, Andy Shannon's group uh, in the King's College in London, so uh, Dr. McCarthy, where they actually took samples from the parrot and peaches um, studies um, and had approximately 400 samples, of which there were, about, there were 24 um, preeclampsia cases of less than 35 weeks. And they took these samples and they analyzed them simultaneously on three platforms. And what they were looking for was to see whether there was any difference in the prediction of de delivery within 14 days um, with those cases of preeclampsia prior to 35 weeks gestation. Because different cutoffs are used, um, it's quite difficult to compare just based on the cutoffs. And so what they were looking for was non-inferiority. And the best way to 
to achieve this was to look at the areas under the curves. Um, and what they observed was there was no difference in the areas under the curves between these three approaches, no differences, statistical differences in sensitivities, in PPVs or in negative predicted values. As a follow on from that study, they then actually looked at um, thresholds for um, the Delphi Express assay for suspected preeclampsia. And um, what they um, identified is that um, a value of less than 50 um, improved on the specificity. So this was um, the threshold for rule in, whereas a value of greater than 150 was the threshold for rule out. Um, as I think back to the, the previous slide, one other comment to make was that it was identified actually that the choice of cutoff is really extremely important. With the Delphi Express PLGF cutoff of one greater than 150, we identified 21 out of the 24 cases of preeclampsia. So that was a sensitivity of 87%. With the S-flit PLGF ratio and the ratio of 38, they identified 18 out of 24 of the cases and um, a sensitivity of 75%. And so what we observed was that the specificity was better for the um, S-flit PLGF, but the sensitivity was better for the PLGF alone. And that in reality is due to the choice of cutoff. So I think that is something we need to sort of be aware of when looking at some of these tests. And that brings me to my next slide. We have recently launched a, an S-FLIT um, assay. And um, one of the things again that I would say is that although you have these published cutoffs for S-FLIT and, and S-FLIT PLGF ratio, they are not directly transferable um, and published cutoffs should only be used as a guidance. Each laboratory must really validate their own cutoffs. Um, and I would actually perhaps contend that the 38 um, maybe is, is not the best cutoff uh, given the sensitivity um, limitations. Even in the prognosis study, the sensitivity was 80% with the cutoff of 38. So for aid in diagnosis and for short-term prediction of preeclampsia, the S-FLIT PLGF ratios um, can be utilized to give you this low uh, short-term prediction rule out. So with the low ratio, um, with the increased ratio, they can be used as a, a rule in test. And then you have this sort of gray zone in the middle um, where they can be used for, for monitoring. But the cutoffs really must be validated in that laboratory. And um, I believe that is my final slide. Um, we, have plenty, we have many resources available if people wish to take a look at um, the Perkin Elmer website. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Yvonne. And I think that was uh, an excellent uh, talk. And I think a lot of detailing on the issues on the you know, rule in and rule out where we can use and that's taking ahead from where the NICE guidelines have left us and I think we really need to look into uh, the utility of these tests and this will help us further in clarifying our doubts. So. Thank you. Um, that was absolutely marvelous and I'm so glad we have this included in our evening uh, series of talks today because it tells us that the laboratories are with us. It also tells us that uh, there is a certain uh, crooked eye that we need to ensure when we're looking at data that comes to us from a laboratory. Because we insist on a cheaper test, a laboratory will often not have a low and high control and then make it available at a less cost. Whereas actually that erodes the very purpose of ensuring quality. So we do have to be very, very careful that if you are going to hit out in somebody and say, look, give me the best quality at the lowest price, it's not going to work. We have to compare costs between what is a dead baby, a, a, a devastated mother, or a mother with a stroke going to be costing to her family and the community and the nation compared to the cost of this one test. 
What is worse is a child that is born with severe neurodevelopmental disability because we didn't intervene on time. And therefore, economics needs to be looked at very carefully. Thank you so much for that, Yvonne. Thank you, sir. So I think uh, with that, we come to our uh, last segment, which is the panel. And I would like to invite all the panelists for the panel. And I think, sir, we have maintaining excellent time. And we are just on time 9.5, which is uh, very good according to our uh, time that is going. And we have around 537 participants online with us. I don't know how many on Facebook. So uh, as we start the panel, I would like to uh, share my screen again. Right. So uh, I would say that, you know, as we go on, we'll take a few questions which are there in the chat also. So which are uh, relevant to the questions on what are happening. So um, Right. So our panel is on embracing new approaches for preeclampsia prediction in uh, aid in the diagnosis opportunities and challenges. So for this panel, we have with us uh, Dr. Suchitra Pandit, Dr. Tilan Praveen, uh, Dr. Vandana Bansal, Dr. Bijoy Balakrishnan, and uh, Yvonne uh, with us already. Now, uh, the how the panel will go is that uh, we will be covering starting from the basics because uh, from what we can see, the questions are coming from right very basic questions uh, on you know when to start aspirin and you know how the uterine artery Doppler. So what we will do is that we will take a few basic questions in between as well, try and cover. And those questions which are not getting covered, maybe we will just take it at the end. And then we will just cover some of the risk factors, prediction approaches that we have covered. And then maybe more in a systematic manner and the first trimester algorithms and the second and the third trimester algorithms. And in the end, I will request Dr. Kurana to sum it up and uh, give an overview of the whole thing. So to begin with, I would like to first... Uh, you know, summarize it in a sense because Suchitra Ma'am has already talked about it, that how do we define uh, preeclampsia and why I'm, I would like to emphasize this again is what has changed significantly from previously. You know, typically what we define preeclampsia and what has changed previously, Ma'am. Hello, are you asking me? Yes, Ma'am, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, basically, I think the amount of uh, proteinuria, presence of proteinuria is a must to, for the definition of preeclampsia. But the amount of proteinuria does not correlate with the severity. And the degree of fetal growth restriction is not a part of the severity. But otherwise, all the other uh, you know, uh, problems, the kidney involvement, the liver involvement, the neurological problems, the hematological complications, they're all a part of the preeclampsia. And severity obviously changes with the, with the definition of the blood pressure, 160, 110 or more. And uh, the, uh, the amount of symptomatology, that changes it. So if it's non-severe, it's anywhere less than 160 and less than 110. But right. for, for, for the definition. Right, ma'am. I think, ma'am, uh, your network is a little uh, patchy. So I would just like to summarize by saying that uh, what has really changed is the, uh, you know, usefulness of proteinuria in the definition of preeclampsia is that even if, you know, the blood pressure is high and there are signs of severity, even without too much of proteinuria, you would consider it as preeclampsia and treat it. Now, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Bijoy, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Welcome to the panel and welcome to the session, Dr. Bijoy. Nice to have you with us. So, Dr. Bijoy, I would like to, uh, ma'am has already mentioned a part of the severity. So, uh -huh. I would like you to tell us is what are the subclass, uh -huh. the significance of sub, uh, such uh, subclassifications? You're talking about uh, the subclassification of preeclampsia, if I'm right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so basically, when we classify them, we classify them based on whether they are early onset or late onset. We are basically looking at the severity of the placental disease. So if you have a really bad placenta, we're going to look at early onset preeclampsia where it develops before 34 weeks, late onset when it develops after 34 weeks, and term preeclampsia when it's 
after 37 at 37 at 37 or greater and free term when it is before 37 so when we are doing this sub classification we are indirectly telling about the severity of placental dysfunction how bad the placenta is and the earlier your preeclampsia starts on more worse is your placental condition and that makes it more amenable to screening because when you try to screen you're looking at markers that are looking at poor placental function and these markers turn up positive for the early onset kind of disease and actually if you look at it when you're thinking about screening and management it is the early onset preeclampsia that always causes a problem rather than late onset because in early onset we know that we're looking at preterm delivery poor survival uh, long term neurological outcomes and things like that whereas in late onset preeclampsia we are our management is going to be a little bit more easier because we are not worried about prematurity and the complications that are associated. So as far as screening is concerned, if you're doing a good job in picking up early onset uh, preeclampsia, it, it, is, it, it is commendable rather than late onset. Yeah, so thank you. I think that is very important because, you know, it is the early onset preeclampsia and the preterm preeclampsia which are really important and most of the prediction is important for uh, those two categories of preeclampsia. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bijoy. So coming to the next question, we all know that, you know, prediction or screening is based on knowing the risk factors. So there are a few questions on risk factors in the chat as well, question answers as well. So coming to that, Dr. Vandana, uh, are you there? So, uh, so welcome yes, to him. Yeah. So, what are the risk factors for preeclampsia? So, Karna, if we start off, I need to first make a statement that a lot of 70% of patients are low risk. So, our preeclampsia would be there in a low risk population also. But yes, we need to look at risk factors. So, by the ACOG and the NICE guidelines, they have made into risk factors which are high risk and the moderate risk factors. So if we go by the high risk factors, we would be looking at more of comorbidities. So if there's a chronic hypertension, chronic diabetes, chronic renal disease, then we would be worried about um, uh, preeclampsia in these cases. Or if there is associated any autoimmune disorders like SLE and things. But on the other side, we also need to look at the maternal characteristic and history. So these moderate risk factors, if we start off, is starting off with the age of the patient. So if we look at age, if it is more than 35 years, it comes into higher risk. And every one year that we increase, the risk increases by about 4%. You've given it also there. Second is, if it is a nulliparous woman, there is a higher risk than a multiparous who has not had a preeclampsia previously. So if there's no preeclampsia in the previous pregnancy, the risk comes down significantly. Then if there's a previous history of one preeclampsia, the risk is very high. So it increases by 15%. Two preeclampsia increases by around 25 to 35%. So a history of preeclampsia has to be asked in all your histories when we are taking a history from them. This interpregnancy interval, um, ACOG says 10 years and more, but by this um, um, FOXI, um, your FIGO guidelines, they talk about less than 12 months, that is one year, or more than six years. Very early again, because there's more nutrition problems and more stress related. And later on, because they develop into advanced maternal age or have some medical disorders, they will come into a high risk zone. All ART pregnancy, as Dr. Suchitra also said, ART pregnancies, not IUI, but IUI, if it is a donor sperm, then they are at higher risk, but all ART pregnancies will double the risk of preeclampsia. We are not asking about histories of the sisters and mothers, which again increase the risk. In addition, they are more of, uh, um, BMI is very important. If BMI is more than 30, and more than 35 is definitely high risk factor. So all these right. risk so, factors have to be asked for, which will pick up only about 40% of our um, risk cases. Others will be picked up on our other prediction that will come on. To right, Dr. Vandana, there is an interesting question which says that in an obese patient with no other high risk factor, should we start prophylactic aspirin? See, we will have to put them into prediction uh, process and then we see whether it comes into high risk and then go on. Single, yeah. single predictors will not decide on the method of uh, yeah. um, treatment that we are going to give to yeah. them. So thank you for that answer. So I think that is very important that, you know, you cannot pick up one single factor and go on that, okay, she has this factor. So we can, you know, just start uh, giving aspirin. So I think we will come to it later, but I think because it was pertaining to history, so I just took up this question here. Now, we will go to this uh, next question. 
that uh, how uh, what factors uh, how so basically when we consider screening uh, how effective is screening uh, based uh, only on uh, maternal factors so dr tln praveen sir yeah uh, good evening everybody good evening. and uh, i would like to thank uh, perkin elmer and uh, i congratulate aparna as well as ashok for uh, doing a wonderful job and putting up this uh, show it's really useful in our clinical practice and the question today is the effectiveness of uh, screening of uh, preeclampsia purely based on maternal factors if you take the maternal factors alone the predictivity or the predictive ability is very very low and it is not applicable for uh, naliparasma and uh, when you take the prediction basically we go by certain screening tests which are extremely important because they are the clinical priority in which we have to base on the clinical characteristics bio uh, biomarkers as well as the ultrasound markers now when we take the maternal characteristics most important thing is the maternal age as well as the bmi as a lot have been uh, said about the bmi as you have already projected uh, as uh, uh, over diagnosing under diagnosing and over uh, uh, treating and under treating this is all based basically because a particular algorithm has not been followed and the maternal characteristics are not really useful and uh, taking into consideration just the bmi or taking into consideration hypertension or taking into consideration the ethnicity or uh, inter interpregnancy intervals these are all factors which we have to be considered but then taking them all alone may not be help may not help us in coming to a, a prediction for the preeclampsia so i think uh, we have to take them as a combination of everything and then only the predictive uh, if you take the predictive capability of uh, maternal characteristic alone the screen pause to rate is only 11% and uh, for pre eclampsia it is 40 and pre term it is about 48% so this is how we have to keep uh, go about right so thank you sir for that answer and before we leave the history part let me just ask suchitra ma'am that there is this interesting question from uh, minakshi rana that what should we do in op newly opened medical colleges where facilities are not available and people and they are not motivated you know cost people are poor cost factor is high and the people are not motivated i think you answered it nicely in your lecture so i want you to you know kind yeah of <clears throat> yeah I, i think first and most important is that history taking i know we keep saying that we miss on cases but if we do that detailed screening of history in an opd where you don't have any other facility apart from your own mouth and you have maybe a blood pressure apparatus and a weighing machine is all that you have the if we if we have this gestosis score which i mentioned about even earlier and then i has brought out those points a lot of you know when we studied this we looked at various different aspects and that's how we computed a score and then when we found that when you are allotting you know you you can actually make a paper a, a, a computer print out and just do a tick mark on that it doesn't take you more than 2 to 3 minutes to quickly go through the questionnaires and if we find that the score is 3 or more in fact if it is th more than 3 it is advisable to start off with aspirin now when we try to look for a reference whether it should be 150 or 75 we did not find the accurate reference as pre yes on the basis of the uh, you know the ultrasound parameters they have mentioned about 150 but when we were looking for it so we've kept it at 75 to 100 but 75 is most likely this can be given and uh, uh, you know if the score is 3 or more and it rash up to uh, 48 hours before induction or you know before the patient is decided to deliver so the simplest basic test is the gestosis score and we find that you know it's easy it doesn't cost you anything apart from getting one computer print out ready and it honestly doesn't take a lot of time and i agree when aparna says in a very busy opd but remember pph is the number one uh, killer for our women the number two is you know pre eclampsia so why can't we do something i understand that if we can do the biochemical and the ultrasound parameters great but at least this first basic thing let's do that and most important is giving information to women giving information to the caretakers ensuring that the women register asap in the antenatal opd rather than come at the traditional 7 months they come as soon as possible 
is much more easier and apart here i'd also like to mention that you know there is one big beautiful group of family physicians which is going fast extinct if we even educate our family physicians to our gynec forums i think that lately anyway, because if the patient goes there first kam se kam they will take the history and the blood pressure and then they will send the patient to you know the um, uh, uh, higher clinic right so thank you ma'am for bringing that point out very beautifully so just uh, going quickly to the next point which is the precautions taken while uh, blood pressure so dr bijoy please can you uh, elaborate on this point uh, although i have covered okay. it a bit so yeah. would like to talk yeah. about the mean arterial pressure the point that i have not talked about no you have already covered about uh, blood pressure but and i totally yeah, agree with this the you know, importance of the mean arterial pressure yeah the, if you look at measuring blood pressure i think the, of all the parameters that you talked about the most difficult thing is to get a good blood pressure measurement i mean if we be honest with all ourselves we'd be the first to jump on doing the uterine artery doppler we'd be doing everything nt scan because it's something that's challenging but i think what's more challenging is to try to take the blood pressure of a woman and to try to make her stop talking that's almost impossible i feel so if you're looking at blood pressure and you look at all the things that you need to do you need to have the woman sitting and you have to have it at the same level of the heart uncrossed legs and all those things i think in a busy opd that's very very difficult to achieve and um, we, i must confess that i am guilty of it as well so I, i i don't think that you know in our in my opd i would be looking at women sitting like this and getting their blood pressure uh, measured in in the correct fashion as has been prescribed Uh, but having said that it is good to try to make an attempt to do that if you want to do proper screening and yes the mean arterial pressure is what we look at and we look at the recordings on both the arms and then we take the average of both the mean arterial pressures as we know the larger the uh, the, the difference between the systolic and the diastolic bp you're going to have an increased risk and so the mean arterial pressure plays a very very important role and its assessment has to be very accurate but having said that how how feasible it is to have all these criteria met in a uh, busy opd in a in the general population is is very difficult to actually have to attain that yeah but having said that if you're able to do it it's a, it's a very good tool yeah it's a, it's a an excellent uh, tool for uh, screening because as as has been rightly told by many other people long before you talked about angiogenic factors or pl given simple proper good the bp measurement can go a long way in preventing uh, the adverse outcomes of preeclampsia so what is the efficacy dr vandana of mean arterial pressure if you just say that okay i go look at maternal factors and mean arterial pressure for screening so mean arterial pressure alone may not be helpful but you need to combine it with the maternal factors so if we started off saying that the risk factors was able to pick up about 40 to 45% you add a mean arterial pressure alone it will increase your early onset preeclampsia by 76% but a preterm preeclampsia by about 50% so it does improve your detection rate if you add your risk factors and add on a mean arterial pressure which doesn't cost anything so even in a government sector i work in a government sector taking a blood pressure in the standard method may be a very good uh, way to find out whether there is a high chance for hypertension in pregnancy yeah it increases by about 76% yeah so thank you so much and i think there is one more question that i would like you to answer is that like i mentioned in my in my talk that you know there might be proteinuria without hypertension right so yeah. if it is a proteinuria with hypertension that what would you first think about because you are you are also working you are an obstetrician so also so how would you approach to that you know first what do you think of and she, there is a question here which says that okay there is a one plus protein urea so what do you do then see the oh. definition now that doesn't include protein urea it may be present it may not be present and if it is urine albumin of 2 plus on a dipstick is taken as protein urea one plus will be false positive in lot of cases but right. as you said if you have hypertension with protein urea i would start thinking it is developing preeclampsia i might want to admit the patient and monitor do all the investigation get her cbc platelet count renal function liver function and also i want to uh, look at the ultrasound to look at the dopplers and the growth of the baby so basically if i find protein urea with hypertension i need to in a government in my setup i will admit the patient because 
sending them off in an opd basis is not what i would do i would admit these patients and then monitor and maybe then start on anti hypertensive if the blood pressure continues to rise uh, after 4 hours of uh, admission so thank you dr vandana for that answer and i would also like to add is that if you do not have a high blood pressure and you are having proteinuria do think of urinary tract infection before jumping to pre eclampsia only yes. so that is another point now coming to the next point which i would like to request dr tln pravin to answer is what is the efficacy of uterine artery doppler and when you are at it please do tell us like some little basic facts about just a few uh, brief about you know uterine artery doppler in your practice like you know how how to do just a basic things and thank you aparna so basically we have all agreed that the early onset pe is basically because of uh, placental dysfunction so uh, uterine artery doppler is a, a best non invasive method in which by which you can assess the uh, placental dysfunction so that is one of the most important thing that we have to keep in mind and uh, quite often to give you a brief uh, account on how we take it because taking the uterine artery doppler in the first trimester is an extremely important parameter in in assessing the preeclampsia or assessing the risk for preeclampsia in which what we need to do is we need to i uh, take a sagittal section of the uterus gravid uterus identify the cervix and then go to the para cervical region try to identify the ascending branch of the uterine artery at the internal os and then take the sample with the sample gate being at about 2 mm so once you do that one the basic important thing is that whenever we have an abnormal uterine artery doppler which is more than 90th centile that is one but particularly in uh, in first trimester uterine artery doppler it has a very high specificity it's almost about 92.1% a low sensitivity that is about 47.8 as far as the preeclampsia that is the predicting the early onset uh, uh, preeclampsia whereas in the late onset or the any onset uh, preeclampsia the sensitivity is less still worse that is it is only about 26.4 now there is one more interesting thing that has developed is uh, using 3d in evaluating what is called as the vascular flow index when we try to use the vascular flow index by using 3d manipulation where we can get the vascular flow index the pre prediction of early onset preeclampsia the vfi that is the vascular flow index is almost about 0.89 whereas the any onset preeclampsia is about 0.77 this is one thing which has come up and which is supposed to be very very sensitive and then it is available in most of the equipment high end equipments which are uh, which we can use while evaluating the uterine artery so these are something which we have to ponder upon in uh, i mean using uterine artery which is extremely important this associated with map and the and the maternal history will definitely help us to come to a reasonable conclusion in identifying or predicting the eclampsia So, so there is a question which says that should it be should we be using uterine artery pi only after 14 weeks because it marks the end of the placentation process but i don't think i mean that is what we would like to say because i think the, we are doing routinely 11 to 14 weeks 14 weeks can we are doing the uterine artery doppler because that's the very ideal time to actually do the uterine artery for prediction of preeclampsia yes. so i think uh, you have answered that question uh, anyway so uh, thank you so i may add uh, over here uh, 14 weeks does not mark the end of the placentation process we do have a first wave and then we have a second wave that lasts all the way to 24 weeks right. so there's no question of postponing to 14 weeks and uh, getting all our values for uh, pape to be completely useless because we know that the value of pape for down syndrome goes terribly low at 14 weeks and so we should stick to an assessment at the time when we're doing our first trimester evaluation unless of course we have the luxury of doing uh biochemistry at 10 weeks and the ultrasound at 12 weeks right so we coming to the next question which is uh, on the role of biomarkers as a screening tool for preeclampsia which is all this whole session is about so dr uh, bijoy let us talk about the biomarkers so just an overview of why are we doing this Uh, placental growth factor and what is the efficacy in isolation and mm-hmm. placental growth growth factor and pape because we are at first trimester basically we are just trying to look at the functionality of the placenta we are trying to assess how good the placenta is in the first trimester and use that as a marker to see if this uh, fetus is going to have growth restriction or the mother is going to develop preeclampsia so for these two things we are looking at two different factors 
and both these factors behave differently for the different subset of diseases that I talked about. PLGF is basically an angiogenic factor. It promotes blood vessel growth. So when you're looking at PLGF and if you have good amounts of PLGF, it tells you that the placenta is having good vascular supply. The, the, the vessels are plenty in the placenta and therefore you're go going to have a good placenta. Whereas PAPE is looking at insulin-like growth factor. It is basically related to growth more than to uh, preeclampsia. And when the PAPE levels are normal, it means your insulin-like growth factor levels are going to uh, work better and the baby is going to grow well. But when it comes to aneuploidy, both these factors are going to be low because you're going to look at a poorly functioning placenta in certain cases of trisomy 18 or 13. But otherwise, when you're looking at preeclampsia, we are more concerned about angiogenic factors of how good this placenta is able to have a good vascular supply, which will uh, prevent the formation of preeclampsia. Now, a little bit of controversy I would like to add on this, that, the, that if you think that placenta is the cause of preeclampsia, then all these screening methods are correct. But there is an alternative hypothesis that the placenta is not the cause and that it is basic cardiovascular problem of the mother which is leading to placental uh, insufficiency and preeclampsia. So that's a different story. But all the same, if you're looking at uh, placental function, we look at these two factors, PLGF and PAPE. One is looking at angiogenesis and the other one is looking at growth and proliferation of the placental tissue. So uh, thank you, Dr. Bijoy. And I found this really interesting illustration in the uh, Journal of Hypertension where the SFLP was actually blocking uh, the VEGF and PLGF and a uh, nice illustration to show that the ratio when it is altered, the placentation is altered. So uh, to, just to remember that SFLT is the anti-angiogenic and PLGF and VEGF are the pro-angiogenic factors. Now, uh, uh, requesting uh, Dr. Praveen to uh, let us know what is the ideal protocol for the third trimester screening. Just to give us, we have been discussing this uh, so far. So, so just to kind of conclude the first trimester screening that, you know, what are the things that we should be using if in an ideal setup when we think that we have everything. Everything yeah. will be source restriction, nothing. So what should we do? Yeah, basically, I think most of the points have been covered. The most important factor is that we need to follow certain algorithms which have been accepted and published or peer reviewed. So that those are the things that we can, we can, which can lead us to a correct prediction or appropriate or accurate prediction of preeclampsia. Now, most important thing is that quite often whenever we take the various measurements in the form of uh, mean arterial pressure or PLGF or uterine artery pulsatility index or PAPE, I think it is always better to convert them into moms because that gives us much more flexibility in identifying these uh, uh, preeclampsia, predicting or risk, predicting the risk for preeclampsia. Now, whenever we have a, a risk of a high risk of about one in hundred, particularly when we take the first trimester combined test, when we call it as a combined test, we need to take into consideration the maternal risk factors. We take into consideration the MAP, we take into consideration the PLGF as well as the uterine artery pulsatility index. And if we have a risk screen positive of about one in 100, then we definitely know that it is associated with high risk. And uh, uh, most interesting thing and very useful thing is that uh, these risk calculators are available free of cost on the, on the FMF webpage. Now, coming to the best practice recommendations, basically we all know that uh, we have to take into consideration not the single factor. We have agreed upon that all the factors have to be taken, like the maternal risk factors, MAP, as well as the, uh, uh, the uterine artery Doppler, all uh, associated with it. The other factors also have to be taken, like the PAPE or PLGF. Now, each one of them, if you take them individually, we know that the risk the, the detection rates are low, whereas if you take uh, uh, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery pulsatility index, as well as the PAPE or PLGF, the detection rates are as high as 74.8%. So basically, we need to go by what is called as the Bayens uh, rule or Bayens law, which tells us about the appropriate detection or prediction of this uh, uh, preeclampsia risk uh, based on various factors which can be responsible for this uh, uh, occurrence of this particular condition. So this is how I think we should approach uh, this problem. So thank you, sir. So I think that is, we discussed the ideal situation when like Dr. Kurana said that in conditions when there are no resource restrictions, at least in those situations, we should know what is ideal and we should practice the ideal. 
now we come to our real life scenario in our situation in india when you know in in larger setup so i would like to ask dr sachitra uh, ma'am that what is the pragmatic approach for uh, preeclampsia screening and as you mentioned that uh, could you just uh, tell us like you know when we do not have uh, in resource restricted settings oh uh, yes usually mostly at the tertiary care centers or at medical colleges uh people do have uh, uh, you know ultrasound is there but everybody may not be trained in the ultrasound particularly uh, sorry just a second uh, the ultrasound uh, uh, as i said you know for the doppler it may not always be possible so in such situations one is assessing as i mentioned even earlier uh, the the gestosis score you assess the maternal risk factors and there are times when you can do at least you know if the nucleus scan or something if that can be done nuclear scan with the dopplers as uh, uh, dr praveen mentioned if that can be done i mean that will definitely play a big role because once that is done and that is combined with the uh, you know uh, with the blood test with the biochemical marker marker i'm not even talking of pl pl gf or i'm not even talking of uh, endoglins but i'm talking of the simple straightforward uh, blood test i think these two would probably be able to give us something more Than what we uh, have just been able to achieve. So I think with the gestosis score, if I know that she's a high risk, I'm definitely going to start her on aspirin. And if I can do that basic screening with the, you know, with the sonography, and even if we can check for the uterine artery dopplers, I think that would also play a big, big role. And yeah. if we have PAPE, you know, I mean, uh, if we're doing the traditional dual marker screening, then of course we know a lot more because if the PAPE is low, if the mom shows less than 0.5. you obviously know that this uh, pregnancy is probably going to have a problem and the baby may not be growing so well it could be a marker for a reduced placental supply so yes you're going to start off an aspirin if you haven't already started on so that way right. yes, the pape is useful dr aparna can i just put yeah. in a pause here? <clears throat> can you hear me yes i can hear you dr bijoy do you mind going back to your slide in which you showed the detection rates of uh, preeclampsia yeah on this slide i want you to look at uh, mean arterial pressure uterine artery pi and pape and the detection rate comes up to 68.2 can you see that yes yes and that's not very bad when you compare 74.8 yeah. and i can tell you a simple trick on how you can increase that 68.2 to higher detection rates you just increase your cutoffs that's all you're using a cutoff of 1 in 100 and you're having a 68.2 detection rate if you increase your cutoff your detection rates will go up your false positive rates will go up but false positive rates here the worst you can do is you can put her on aspirin yes that's what's going to happen so i would suggest that you using a combined test you're already doing all of this all centers most centers mo at least most fetal medicine centers and most colleges have the facility of doing a combined test so when you're doing a combined test you add your uterine artery pi and your mean arterial pressure into that and you increase your cut off make it 1 in 200 or 1 in 250 and try to do that in on on a complete india based study and then you will find that your detection rates are much higher and right. the, the downside will be that your false positive rates will be higher but you're not doing amniocentesis or nipt here the false positive people are only going to get aspirin at a higher dose so i i would i would be ready to take that risk rather than going in for uh, for an expensive test i'm just giving you my my thoughts yeah right so i think uh, i think that's yeah. a point well right taken point. Uh, what what uh, i think uh, what is being said is that when we are actually doing a combined screening for uh, aneuploidy we might as well piggy back a preeclampsia screening with Absolutely. a combined so i think a po the point is well taken and uh, needs to be considered uh, in the real scenario mm -hmm. so now going on to the next question is that uh, dr vandana what is contingent screening and is there any role of contingent screening and uh, what in a, in brief what is would you do if it was a twin pregnancy would it differ your preeclampsia screening or it remains the same uh, first is contingent screening starts off like how we do it in aneuploidy screening that we first look at risk factors and get them into low risk and high risk and only the ones which are high risk you would want to do this test of combined screening plus the preeclampsia prediction score so this will reduce down your cost but i don't think it is going to improve our detection rate because you have reduced down all your low risk patients from this so i don't think this contingent screening is a good idea in indian population 
because you've already taken out all the low risk factors. I would believe in what Bijoy is saying and I would also say the same thing that everybody in India is now doing an aneuploidy screening and part of that NT, if everybody knows how to do, can also know how to do a uterine artery screening. So adding your mean arterial pressure, your risk factors and your uterine artery with your routine aneuploidy screening with the pap pay, you're almost reaching 70% of your prediction. So I would think for India, this would be a pragmatic method of prediction. For multiple pregnancy, you will go with the same method that you would look at the same thing, but uterine artery again is not very good in this. And the detection rate improves, but the false positive are very high. So if you screen everyone, about 70% of all your twin pregnancy will come out as screen positive. So you will pick up a lot of your high risk uh, factor, uh, high risk pregnancies, but you will have a lot of them who are false positive, which will all will have to be started on aspirin. So multiple pregnancy, the same method will go on, but you will get a lot of false positives to start them on aspirin. Yeah. So uh, thank you, ma'am. Yes. But then uh, actually, as you all suggested that in a clinical practice setting up, doing a mean arterial pressure is not that easy. <laughs> So when you take one factor which is not that easily accommodated, then it becomes very difficult for us to achieve that sort of a high percentage of detection rates. Right, sir. So uh, now going on to the second trimester screening. So I think we've had a lot of discussion on the first trimester screening. Now going on to the second trimester screening. So uh, going to Yvonne, uh, can you tell us what is the role of, I think we've had some discussion, you presented a study. So just to kind of, you know, emphasize it more. So what is the role of uh, SFLT PLGF ratio in the prediction of PE in the second trimester? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I think before we go into this slide, I just wanted to mention that we've got the sort of concept of prediction and then we've got actually the management of symptomatic women. So the FMF has actually looked at prediction in terms of screening all women at three time points, 19 to 24 weeks, 30 to 34 weeks, and 36, around 36 weeks. And um, again, using a sort of multi-risk parameter, for example, at 30 to 34 weeks, to SICAS et al. Um, 2016 in AJOC, showed with the full protocol, which is uterine artery PI, MAP, PLGF, and SFLIT, that they could get a 98% prediction for preterm preeclampsia at a 5% false positive rate, which would be expected because we're now very close, and about a 49% prediction for term. Beyond that, screening at 35 to 37 weeks, which we really think is going to be something that people are going to explore much more in the future, Andrietti et al. in 2016 in ultrasound OBS and GYN again looked at uh, maternal factors plus PL, Jeff, and S flit, and that gave a 79% detection rate at a 10% false positive rate for term preeclampsia. And certainly, if we think now that uh, there's been several publications looking at induction of um, pregnancies, I see that that is something that people are starting to explore. Adding MAP and adding UTPI could take that up to 84%. So if we now move on to the, the slide that you had first, which is the prognosis study. So here we can see, um, and actually perhaps I would highlight more the data from the validation cohort because that's really the sort of the important data. Here, if we look within one week, the sensitivity is 80%. So this is where I was saying that this is being used as a rule out test, but in actual fact, you still have 20% of your preeclampsia cases that you're missing. And so um, like here again, I would be thinking that perhaps with that cutoff, maybe that is perhaps not the most optimal cutoff. What it does mean is that you, get, you can get quite a good specificity so that you're not inappropriately hospitalizing women. Um, they also have looked at this sort of within four weeks um, rule in concept where they achieved around a 37% um, positive predictive value. <clears throat> Moving on to the next um, slide. Um, again, I think this re-emphasizes the same point because the ratio has got a pooled sensitivity of 80% with a specificity of 92%. Um, 
again, it's, it's really to do with cutoffs uh, and where you place those cutoffs, but it, it can be a valuable tool for supporting decision making, but should not be used as a standalone. And I think that is also, as we move to the next one, where we think about the INSPIRE um, study. This was, um, it was a good study, and they were looking at a, a ratio of 38, um, would define the patient as being low risk, within seven days, and an elevated risk of greater than 38 would be, again, within seven days. But even then, when they were looking at the low ratio, they were still looking at clinical factors, and really they would make their decision based on the clinical factors. So they would disregard the ratio if the clinical factors resulted them in them thinking that this was necessary for that patient to be admitted. Um, so the knowledge of the ratio is only used as an indication for admission and follow-up, and it was also not used for delivery. Um, the next um, slide that I believe you have is also looking at PLGF alone. So this is um, from the uh, PARROT study and um, to, um, to one of Dr. Karana's points, this is from the UK where um, cost is a big issue. And so a lot of work has been done on PLGF only in the UK. Um, and here again, that they found that, you know, it could support clinical uh, decision making, um, but it actually did substantially reduce the time to the confirmation of the clinical confirmation of preeclampsia. Uh, and they saw a reduced incidence of maternal adverse outcomes. So again, I think there is a role for these biomarkers, but it clearly has to go with, um, you know, assessment from a clinical perspective. Um, and they're not, they should not be used as a standalone. Yeah, so I think uh... There is the, in this study also, uh, they probably did not find too much of a difference in terms of perinatal outcomes. Uh, so I think uh, they did find a lot of benefit in terms of the maternal adverse outcomes, but uh, mm -hmm. the perinatal outcomes were uh, not very significantly different. So yep. I think uh, so much of evidence, and because this was another, uh, you know, two very big trials which have actually shown uh, that there, these biomarkers are having some a lot of evolving role to play. So it's time to actually think about these markers in our daily clinical practice. So, um, so thank you uh, for those inputs. So uh, Bijoy, I would like to know, you know, uh, th that was a lot of scientific research. So in simple terms, would you like to tell us that, you know, what is the difference between a roll-in versus roll-out, rule-out, rule-in versus rule-out? Like, you know, how does it differ in terms of when you try to assess a test? Okay, I can do this with the help of a simple example. But let me just tell you about all tests. Okay, a test, we're basically assessing about rule-in and rule-out is basically positive predictive value and negative predictive value. When you're ruling out a test, you're saying that the negative predictive value is good. When you're saying ruling in, you're saying positive predictive value is good. Now, both those things depends upon the prevalence of the disease and how good your test is. Now, you're looking at the same test in a population that is having a prevalence of preeclampsia of, say, 10% or something. So if you have an 80% detection rate, and if that comes out as negative, you can confidently rule out preeclampsia in that group because the prevalence of the disease is less. It's around 10 to 14 percent. But if the test turns out to be positive, you can't confidently say that the woman has preeclampsia. It just tells you that you need the, to make other solid criteria, the other solid diagnostic criteria needs to be met before you say that the person has preeclampsia and you do not go into intervention strategies thinking that the screening test is positive, therefore the mother is pre having preeclampsia. A simple example I can give you is that if you do the HIV screening test, ELISA test, in a group of nuns. And if it comes out as negative, you're all absolutely sure that they don't have HIV. But if it turns out as positive, do you immediately brand them as having HIV? Because the prevalence of HIV in the nun population is going to be extremely low. So therefore, if the test turns out to be positive, it does not mean that you rule in HIV. But if it turns out to be negative, you can definitely rule out HIV because of the prevalence of the disease within that community. Yeah. I hope that's clear. Yes, I think uh, that was very, very amply clear. 
and uh, so that is what uh, so this these are the guidelines and i think this need to be revised further but yes so the plgf based testing has been uh, suggested to be used as a rule out test so this is what uh, bijoy has said that if it comes out to be negative then the chances that the woman is going to develop preeclampsia is very less but if it turns out to be positive it doesn't mean that you know she is going to develop preeclampsia so that becomes very important to understand that so like in the patient that i talked about if she today the test is negative that i am very happy i will discharge that patient tomorrow that she is not going to develop preeclampsia i will send her home so this is a rule out test so that is very important to understand but if she is positive i will not get very hyper or worried that she is going to develop preeclampsia so thank you bijoy for clarifying that point so coming back to you ivon what is the point of care test you have talked about it the congo red uh, for prediction of preeclampsia in the second and the third trimester would you like to talk about it in bit of a detail this is my last question for you and then i will invite our expert dr kurana to conclude this session Okay, um, I, I'm not going to provide huge detail on this. Um, the, the actual test, again, so it, it's based on the fact that women with preeclampsia have been shown to have these amyloid-like proteins in their urine, and these proteins have an affinity for a dye called Congo Red. Um, and this can be a very simple test. Um, it's a staining on a paper, like nitrocellulose paper, um, and if you get sort of a staining and you get a, a large spot from this, then this suggests that these amyloid proteins are present in the urine of this woman. So it, it could be a potential tool for identifying women with preeclampsia and could be a, a good tool for triage, particularly from a primary care setting to identify women to send to a tertiary setting. Um, most of the work has been, been done by Dr. Irina Buhimchi in the United States. Um, with some studies in places such as South Africa um, and other parts of Asia. But it, it really does need to be tested now in, in, in many settings uh, and tested with um, a representative set of patients to see how it works clinically and where it adds value. And at the moment, I don't think we have the, um, the data yet to provide that sort of feedback. Um, but there is a lot of interest. Okay, so, so, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Kurana to uh, wind this panel and uh, summarize the points. So, sir. Um, thank you. Are you able to see my screen? Or? Yes, sir. Yes. We can see you. Yes. And I will just shift over to uh, full screen. There we are. So, uh, to summarize, and I promise you at the end of it, we will still have five or seven minutes left for some questions. We cannot see your stream. Ah, oh, you cannot? Yeah. Okay, I will recheck with that. And I will stop share and share again. Is that coming on now? Are you able uh, to then you have to, you have to have, ah, yeah, now it's, it's done. It's done. Yeah. So um, essentially well, what I would like to emphasize before we close for today is um, that we have felt the need for, for doing something because we know that after hemorrhage, we are looking at hypertension as our major killer. And we do realize that we do so much with Down syndrome, we certainly can do a lot more for preeclampsia which also contributes to fetal growth restriction and also contributes to preterm birth. And the good news, of course, is that we are able to do something now with our first trimester screening. Also, like I said, we are not just looking at the usual three to 4% of incidents. There are areas in India which report a 33% uh, incidence of preeclampsia and disorders of pregnancy. Uh, the good news is that we now have, as we've understood, a personalized risk estimate in the first trimester and it's a great no. No, you're not. your screen is not moving 
My screen disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's there. Is it now back it, on again? Now, it is. now again we can see, but it's getting hung in between. Okay. How about now? You now see. now it's good. Yeah. 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 And, um, the the thing is that when we look at any of the clinical uh, factors, such as the NICE guidelines, the ACOG clinical features, the New Zealand ones, when we look at the final performance, it's very tragic. Uh, we're looking at a preeclampsia detection of 5% if you use the ACOG guidelines. And you're looking at the NICE guidelines, which will tell you about 39%. And yet, when we look at uh, some of the recent work that came out in 2017, the O'Gorman study, we actually have a 100% detection rate if we do it correctly. So if we do it correctly means that you're not going to be compromising any of this. And if we do it correctly would be, of course, by using, I, I, I personally prefer the FF, FMF uh, way of going about it. And in that situation, our older data then changes completely. And if we do a mean arterial pressure and the uterine artery PI, the PAPI and the PLGF, we have like a 100%. So this kind of a thing is really nice. We have a uterine artery PI, PLGF, also by themselves, identifying almost everything. And then there was that story about should we just use PLGF and not PAPE? What we're trying to do in India actually today to justify at the government level that we need to look for, whether we need to do first trimester screening is to try and convince the government that preeclampsia is a great killer of women and children, that it destroys the brains of women and children and their lives in general. And therefore, we actually need to do preeclampsia screening and we will piggyback our Down syndrome screening on preeclampsia screening. And then the government will agree because the numbers of preeclampsia are more uh, better. And so it's very important to do it the correct way. And remember, it's not just for preeclampsia, but we're improving uh, the outcomes in several other groups as well because screening will identify a cardiovascular risk, uh, the risk in patients with previous hypertension, the risk in patients with a prothrombotic risk, such as an immune disease and so on and also in diabetes mellitus and, and polycystic ovaries. We have ISUA guidelines, which we can follow very nicely. And we do understand that there is this continuum of growth restriction, abruption, preeclampsia, help and stillbirth, which follow the same pathway and they can be uh, handled as well. We've already learned that yes, we have uterine artery flow, PAPI and PLGF in the first trimester and later in pregnancy, the SFLT, which is the anti-angiogenic going up, and the PLGF or the VEGF going down, and the PLGF is in clinical use already. Uh, Bijoy also partly highlighted that there might be a different pathway, which means a maternal cardiovascular status, and there is possibly a third pathway as well, which is the immunogenic pathway, and it is possible that we might start looking at pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines in the future to try and tell more of what's going on and trying and figuring out perhaps even a genetic predisposition. We know that the aspirin study has really put all this into, uh, into perspective because we have here a risk that can be modified to prevention and nothing could be uh, better than that. Low dose aspirin, as we've decided, has to be uh, greater than 100 milligrams. Uh, the original dose is, even for cardiac disease was always 2.4 milligrams per kg but because the pharmaceutical people were throwing in at 60 or 70 or 80 or 81 uh, mg, therefore we were trying one. But we know that whereas the general um, aspirin resistance is about 15% in the non-pregnant population, aspirin resistance is 30% in the pregnant population. And therefore we need at least 100 milligrams. <clears throat> and looking at our BMIs, we probably need a straightforward single figure of 150 milligrams and of course, it's at night because uh, thrombosis is much worse in the middle of the morning. We also have to remember that at the time of the anomaly scan, if we look at the uterine arteries again, you can again re-stratify the risk. And again here, we will make sure that we will do it in the right way by taking a mean of the PI of the right and the left. Remember that with transvaginal scanning, the PIs are higher than transabdominal scans. And uh, you might find discrepancy between the right and the left. You will still do a mean and not go by just the worst one. We've had this fantastic introduction uh, to the Congo Red uh, story, uh, which is a point of care uh, situation where we know that uh, Congo Red uh, binds to misfolded proteins. And if you mix the urine 
uh, with Congo red dye and then take it out and put it onto this cellulose paper, uh, the filter paper. Uh, it will then show you a diffusion pattern which you can recognize and the six pattern has been made even simpler into a three pattern. And uh, uh, I know Dr. Parna is going to take this uh, validation study through in the next few uh, months and the paperwork for that has already been done and we look forward to using this uh, for ourselves. We also realized that we now have a third trimester uh, time to delivery situation where if we take out the ratio between SFLT and PLGF, uh, we will be able to uh, use uh, this as a rule out tool and uh, work well to make sure that our patients don't get admitted unnecessarily and the ones that do need it will then find beds uh, for themselves. We realized that the prognosis study has given us great results. We love taking everything with a sack of salt, but the fact is that this has given us excellent results and it had some great workers uh, working on it. Um, we've also realized that this business of rule in and rule out is pretty good and we have a one week window and a four week window and the one week window so far seems to be working uh, pretty well. And then I want to spend three or four minutes on this um, excellent piece of um, of work which has been given to us by a group that reported this as an opinion in the January 2020 issue of the White Journal, the Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology as an article written by Leona Poon and her colleagues all over the world. And it said that the first trimester screen should be maternal risk factors, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery PI, PLGF and PAPE. And the ones that go into high risk will then go through this pathway and the low risk will again be reassessed at the time of their anomaly scan uh, and then be seen whether they move into a high risk because of multiplying this factor by the risk that is now available from their first trimester screening. For the high risk ones, again, we will reassess them at the same time um, as the anomaly scan or perhaps even independently at 18 or 22 weeks and then change the pathway. There are two pathways available to us. The first is based on the FMF combined algorithm, which is a free download, as you just heard, from the FMF website, and it's a calculator. And it contains all this information. You put the information in, and then you get three categories, a low risk, an intermediate risk, and a high risk. The low risk will then just have their scan at 36 weeks, 35 to 37. The intermediate risk will be reassessed closer to 30 weeks, and the high risk will have a weekly clinical assessment of, of blood pressure and proteinuria at home with BP monitoring very closely at 24 to 31 weeks, and that is the important bit. You could alternatively move into luxury and have the choice of SFLT1 PLGF ratios, where if the ratio is less than 38, then you have a standard surveillance. Between 38 and 85, you increase the surveillance, and greater than or equal to 85, uh, you have a high level of surveillance, which is the same one as over here. All patients at any way will always be assessed at 36 weeks to see what's going to be happening. And therefore you have to be uh, watching out even for the low risk patient at 36 weeks. And that is the importance of the 36 week scan, which then I would also like to always include my uterine artery if, in case uh, SFLT and PLGF are not available at that time. And then, like I said, the ratio less than 38 progression within one week unlikely and uh, a ratio greater than 38 progression within four weeks likely as a rule in rule out tool. We've heard about twin pregnancies. Remember that although there is a 75% screen positive, it's still worth it. And then this, we've heard about this and uh, we heard from Dr. Suchitra about the organization gestosis, which is giving us a gestosis score with clinical criteria and the validation will be available soon. Within FIGO also, we have very straightforward guidelines for resource restricted communities, which includes most parts of our country. And that means that we will look at maternal characteristics. We will look at mean arterial pressure, maternal weight gain, clinical edema, albuminuria, and then refer to a tertiary care center for further evaluation. And this I think is what must apply to us. The problems of taking blood pressure, well, perhaps we could train assistants to actually take blood pressure correctly. And the second question was um, the question of uterine artery. 
I find that sometimes while I'm waiting for the NT, it's just so much fun finishing the rest of the stuff like uterine artery that it really takes no extra time. The only thing is that you have to be sensible enough to always buy a machine that has color Doppler on it. So I think that all in all, we have a nice rosy picture. And um, the last bit I'd like to highlight is what Dr. Thiel and Praveen um, highlighted for us. And that is that we can actually move on to beyond just looking at vessels to looking at 3D. And uh, some of this work was done in India originally, and it was done uh, with our group. And we presented this six years ago that producing a volume calculation of 3D vascular indices gives us cutoffs for the uh, vascularization index, the flow index, and the vascularization flow index. There is no doubt that at the moment, this requires expertise and high-end equipment and cannot be used as a population screen, but it can be certainly used in those um, that come for specific paid care. And with that, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, giving me this chance to play as an expert on this. We still have a few minutes uh, left, and if there's any other questions, and it's all open to everybody else to make their comments, please. Thank you, sir. I think uh, brilliantly summarized all the points together and that uh, timeline chart, I think really summarized and give, gave us like really new options for thinking about how to go about things. So, uh, sir, uh, there are a few questions. What do we do about them? Like I think we, 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 uh, six minutes over time only. And if there's some really pressing questions, we finish those. Otherwise, I'm going to put you in Bijoy and, and, and Vandana together for this and a, a nice little panel to email all the answers to people. Yeah, I think we can do that later. Yes, yes. yes. So perhaps then we'll call it a day here and uh, we'll uh, answer to the rest of the questions by email. And uh, my special thank you uh, to Ms. Yvonne Parker for being here with us as a panelist. My very special thank you to Dr. Suchitra Pandit who uh, came in because Dr. Alpesh Gandhi couldn't join us, but thank you so much for emphasizing. Um, I was going to talk about it already, as, my, as you must have guessed from my conclusion slide, that I really have uh, a faith in the fact that we could put the operation gestosis data here for us. My thanks to uh, Bijoy and Vandana uh, for being here, for Dr. Thiel and Praveen for being the most fantastic guiding line, uh, guiding light that we can ever have for the Society of Field Medicine and for Parna for being so dynamic. I'd also like to thank uh, Divakar uh, for uh, helping out with this whole organization along with Sandeep and uh, Dr. Chirayu for putting that excellent perspective on lab tests. There's a big gap we have with lab tests and when you give us that data, we're absolutely convinced that we work as a team and we don't work in isolation. Thanks so much. My special thanks to Vishal for running around as usual. As you know, he's our Director of Operations at the Society of Human Medicine and to Sumit Kai in Conferences International uh, for putting this together. And thank you very much, Parkin Elma, for all the support in our education. Thank you and- Thank you very much. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, good night, Thank sir. you, everybody. Good night. Yeah. Good night.